welcome, welcome to the Bliss Fest 2017. It's an incredible night. The sun is just setting out there. There's a few raindrops coming down, and bliss is in the air. And we are pleased today to have on the Stay Human Co- podcast, Miss May Erlon. And uh, we are super stoked to have you here because my favorite thing about going to a festival is I never check the list. I just walk around and I wander into tents and I find the most amazing artists. And today you were that person. Oh, thank you. So thank you for being here. Cool. My pleasure. Yeah. So, you know, I was just asking around before, I, you know, because I got to check out the people who I get on this podcast. I don't want to <laughs> bring in any Uh-oh. objectionables. <laughs> so I was asking around about you and they said, you know, May is like queen of northern michigan music people speak so highly of you mm-hmm. and i wanted to know more about you so tell me where are you from exactly or where do you live at least right now i live in traverse city mm-hmm. and i grew up in big rapids and ann arbor mm-hmm. um, both places a little bit so i'm a michigan girl michigan girl yeah um go big blue Yep, my, okay. my dad went to U of M, and so did my sisters. But My dad did, too, by the way. Oh, really? Yeah, my father's from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Where? He's from Ewan, a tiny town called Ewan, yeah. which is known for their 1932 World's Fair load of logs. They sent 50 logs from <laughs> Ewan, Michigan, pulled by a mule train, and that's what they're known for. <laughs> yeah, and my dad. <laughs> nice. so, so you grew up? Around these parts. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so where you grew up exactly, was it a small town, big town? I mean, Ann Arbor is a big town, but were you living in a small town? Big Rapids town? was a small town, small college That's town. That's why they name it Big Rapids, right? Well, it was a logging town. Okay. So the Big Rapids were a big deal. Yeah. And there's a big Muskegon ri- River runs through it. Uh-huh. So that's where the Big Rapids came from, but it's not a big town. Yeah. Um, and when you were there growing up, what was it like at that time? It was smaller than it is now. It's it was kind of like a budding college mm-hmm. town then, and it's a little bit bigger now. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's a pretty conservative small mm-hmm. town, like yep. a lot of like just sort of rural mentality. But how many people live there? I'm not even sure. Like, I'm not a number like of hundreds persons. or thousands or no, like thousands. Yeah, thousands. Many so thousands. maybe yeah, yeah. twenty thousand. So not like, like yeah, not like the UP. Not like not like the UP. <laughs> not not like you and and their load of logs. <laughs> right. Yeah. So so you know, big or small town. But it feels like a small town. Like you know a lot of the people that go to the high school with you or something like that. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah. And like sm- and, you know, very like. Um, like small community people yeah. all know each other and yeah. yeah so intimate in that way yeah nice yeah. and when you were growing up what was your things that you were super into what did you like to do or have you always been into music or pretty much um i like i grew up in a musical family mm-hmm. i was home educated for most of my school years wow. so my parents were super encouraging of mm-hmm. the arts and they were like kind of the oddballs in the neighborhood. They were like <laughs> the vegetarian Buddhist, you know, family in Big Rapids, Michigan, which, you know, I you know, I still had a lot of families and friends that accepted us despite those things. <laughs> but it, but it was an interesting way of town to grow up in. Um, and so they were very encouraging of, of whatever creative thing I was into. And my, my gr- grandma was an artist, uh-huh. visual artist. Wow. And so um, the arts were a big part of my family. Yeah. Yeah. So you're growing up and you're in this kind of conservative town. And in your household, it's like vegetarian, Buddhist, yoga, kombucha drinking, music playing. <laughs> yeah. and, and at what point did you decide like, I may, I'm going to pick up that guitar in the corner. What was your first instrument? How did you How did you get into it when when you became first conscious of it? I found it through voice first. Mm-hmm. I've just sang from yeah. the moment I could talk. So wow. that the vehicle is there. Yeah, and it still is the place where I feel like I can express the most. Mm-hmm. But I I started playing piano early. Mm-hmm. Uh, never how like how early? Probably like eight because there was just okay. one in the house you know yeah. and i took some lessons never got like you know classically trained or anything yeah. played a little violin but at, at 11 i picked up the guitar and i wrote a song immediately was and that was the like, first song you ever wrote well yeah one you know that i wrote down and yeah. you know well did you have one before that that you didn't write down i had like, a lot of little things i would make up but okay. i never took them very seriously so like something what? About what was the, what was one that you wrote before you could even rem- remember to write it down i 
my first song that I remember writing yeah. when I was like probably like four. Yeah. Was it went uh, Birdie can't fly, Mama tell me why. Birdie can't fly, so Mama tell me why. Wow, that was it. that's, that's it. beautiful! Wow. <laughs> That's like an environmental anthem. You realize if you came out with that today, you'd inspire the whole movement? I mean, people would be shutting down pipelines. They would be breaking dams. And I mean, that's a beautiful song. Where did that come from? Did you have an experience where you saw a bird that couldn't fly? Or? My parents are part of wildlife rescue, mm -hmm. where you take in animals and help yeah. you know, rehabilitate them and then release them. So wow. we had that around my whole well, childhood. So, so, so yeah, it was very so they, so, literal. So you yeah, had literal. It was little, happening. The bird can't fly. <laughs> yeah. What's going on? Yeah. Because yeah. in my house, birdie can't fly meant my mom was serving fried chicken that night. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was not the vegetarian, you know, no. Buddhist household that, yeah. you know, I now am. Um, so <laughs> then you're 11, you pick up guitar, and then how did that happen? What, what, what went on in your development musically? I just, I think it's stories and the voice that really excite mm -hmm. me. So it was a vehicle immediately mm -hmm. to tell stories. And yeah. there was a lot that I wanted to tell. So mm -hmm. songs just, I just felt really comfortable with the songwriting idea mm -hmm. yeah. in that sense. And so I realized like, this is, this is like clicks. Yeah. This feels like something. What were the stories that you were interested in telling at that time? Well, you know, I was like a young teenager. Mm -hmm. So at first, a lot of them were just sort of like, more you know you just sit down and play and yeah. whatever comes whatever in comes to you, right yeah. and so they're a little more far out yeah actually. like what give us one i don't remember them. <laughs> no, no. they were really yeah. far <laughs> out <laughs> you know, so far out i can't remember <laughs> yeah no i haven't played them in forever but yeah. um and then of course i went through like the teen angst like oh, heartbreak yeah. like i am the most important thing and mm -hmm. so is all of my pain and, you know, <laughs> just, well let's hear one of those you've got to have one of i those. don't I, I like one thing about me is i don't have a great memory and the songs come in okay and there's like library shelf space you know yeah. somebody somebody has to go your, your hard drive is uh, <laughs> yeah over, and they're, they're documented i mean i have yeah, them but i don't play them um yeah and what I, were they about, though? What were the types like of things? Just like heartbreak or yeah. just longing or yeah. just being angry about mm -hmm. whatever I thought was unfair. What were you angry about at that time? Probably just my parents not letting me do what I wanted or just people treating me in a way that Let I Let me just get a grip on this. Your parents were like the hippie, Buddhist, vegetarian, <laughs> musical, pot smoking, you know. I'm, I'm just conjecturing. But what in the hell could you have possibly wanted to do that they wouldn't let you do? Well, right. It's like I had everything I wanted, so I wanted <laughs> the, the hell out of there as okay. fast as possible, you okay. know. And so, yeah, it was. I was totally yeah. gifted and privileged. Yeah. And had a great a support system. Yeah, but, but you wanted to I find wanted something to, more. Yeah, okay. I wanted to feel what else was out there. Yeah, and it was pretty sheltered in that okay. way. Yeah, and my own identity. I didn't have a lot of room. Mm -hmm. A sort of middle child didn't have a lot of room to figure out mm -hmm. what my identity was. Right. As me, so I think everybody goes through a moment yeah, sure. where they really want that. Yeah. And so I think that was my rebellion. I hear you. Yeah. But it wasn't because I didn't have what I needed in, yeah. you know, all of the basics. So what? At what point did you get to spread your wings in that way? Did you finish high school and then break out, or did you? I did not run away <laughs> from home school. <laughs> I um I did go to school some of the time, but I um <laughs> at sixteen I negotiated to. Uh, go traveling across the country. Wow. So I played music and traveled all over the country and hitchhiked and train hopped and went all wow. over for for like three years. You train? Mm -hmm. What do you call it? Train? Train hopping. Train hop. Okay. Yeah. I thought you said train app. Like there was a new app that you'd like <laughs> well, go that's, on the shoes. Oh, the train's coming at 6.30. I'm going... Yeah. It actually would be so much easier, I'd imagine, now with yeah. all the apps that you have. Yeah, it's like people know. are using like paper train guides that they rob wow. from like the engineers. You well. know? Like, <laughs> was that you? Is that your gag to go and pickpocket the engineers? Oh, and, no. They, okay. they put them out. Like it was okay. like an underground, like who's got the, oh, I forget what they're called, but yeah, they're like a guide of like where wow. you could go to hop on So trains. tell me about that. What was the first time you hopped a train? I mean, this is like, this is like what a real musician does, you know, like, <laughs> I was a train hopping, I went to San Antonio, you know, like, this is like the stuff of musical lore, you know, like, tell us about the first time you hopped the train, what was that like? The first time was actually just in Ann Arbor, yeah. and I had a friend, and we were just up late hanging out, and he's like, oh, there's a train, and he had done it many times, yeah. he's like, let's get on it, 
Yeah. I was like, where does it go? He goes, it doesn't go that far. Like, <laughs> let's just get on it and get off. Like, and I was like, I've never done it. And he he just gave me some really quick basics. Yeah. And then, what are the basics of train home? Just so that we can tell <laughs> other 16 year olds out there. Um, well, it's very dangerous. <laughs> put that out, off the bat. But you have to be able to count the bolts on the wheel before you even consider jumping on okay so that means indicating that it's slowed down enough to, yeah to go okay. and i don't know what they're really even called wheels but yeah. the, you know sure you've got to be able to count the bolts and then you got to run and you got to be okay. able to run at the speed because otherwise you're going to like be yeah. caught so and now you running on the ties is it like you're running that close to, or the ties under the i guess they're under the they're under the train, so you're running, train. Okay. So you're running on gravel. Horrible and dangerous. Yeah, horrible and dangerous. <laughs> and, if you, and if you fall, you're going to slide down like a ten foot ravine into, right. into so a creek full of snakes. So ideally, you want it to be right? really slow. Yeah. And for me, I, I would just like, can't we just wait till it stops? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're running, running, and, jump on, come on, jump on. And it's easier to do that. A lot of times, you can wait till it stops and get on successfully. But getting off, you yeah. often have to get off when it's going. Oh, wow. And so that you have to run in the air. Because Can you demonstrate that on a <laughs> podcast? I mean, running in there. I'm 35 now. I thought you were a folk years. singer. Turns out you're a superwoman. <laughs> no. So, any, yeah. I mean, I didn't. I trained up for a little while, but because it was so hard and dangerous, I didn't, yeah. you know, hitchhiking is way safer. Where did you go? Easier. What's, like, how far of the journeys would you take? I hitchhiked, or I train hopped. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. I went across, like, from... Chicago over Chicago is a scary city to yeah. hop out of. Oh, I bet, yeah. Um, but I did. You get hit by an L train, <laughs> right? And yeah. went over to like the northwest and yeah. up and down the northwest is well, pretty much the only train. That must have been beautiful in, in, oh my in gosh. the back country there. And, you yeah. feel like you're like in on a big secret because yeah. you see all this landscape. There, cars aren't allowed to go there. Yeah. People even don't go to a lot of the spaces. Wow. So you're just like, kind of this little like magic you're not supposed to be there you know natural and, area 51 you know? right. <laughs> right and you know it's a totally like you can get caught and you have to kind of hide so there's this yeah. sneaky like ninja aspect about it that's pretty wow. fun at a, as a teenager you know it's yeah like, but, and so all this time were you playing writing did you have an instrument with you yeah i always played and that's how i made money on the road i mm -hmm. busked and yeah it's still one of my favorite things to do yeah i like it too it's Really beautiful yeah. art, I feel like. Yeah. So I play it all the time. Yeah. On the road. And what kind of songs would you be writing? Um, I wrote about traveling. I played a lot of cover songs. Mm -hmm. I played a lot of country swing yeah. songs. You know, nice. I would see somebody and think, oh, what could I play that would like lift their spirit in this mm. moment? I've only got you know half a minute. Yeah. Of their time. Yeah. Or whatever. So. To connect as you're busking, you know. You yeah. Know. Okay. Um, and then I play some of my songs that were just sort of like heart opening, just yeah. like, you know, my stuff that I felt like singing at the time. Wow. Wow. Um, what's your musical mission? Like, what's your purpose as a musician? Why do you do it? Um, it's, it's probably changed over the years, but I think the main thing is to be useful. Mm -hmm. And I think where I'm most useful is often trying to encourage and help people be in a heart space mm -hmm. instead of a head space yeah um and i found that that's the the sort of most useful place that i can talk about mm -hmm. different you know things going on in the world that are maybe challenging for mm -hmm. people to, to hear like once you get into a heart space then we're all sort of in a safe space yeah. and we can talk about things and that's just like when you're trying to communicate with somebody about something hard that's the yeah. mission so I found that music has really offered that to me mm -hmm. um, and just helping people feel and also feel things that we're scared to say mm. and, and just the vulnerability aspect yeah. that we're all existing in all the time. Yeah. So my mission, I guess, is to really speak to that vulnerability mm -hmm. and to make use of that space nice. and, and to have, have a voice in it. Yeah. I think that's more important now than ever with everything that's happening in our country right now. There's so much division, you know, socially politically, environmentally, over sexuality, over religion, so many things. And it's really important for all of us to speak our most passionately about our beliefs and the direction that we want to see the world going. But I think even more important than that right now is, is all of us having that ability to listen.
mm-hmm. and to have an open mind and open heart to people who come from a different experience, a different walk of life. And I, I'm with you. I, I really believe that music helps us to access that, you know, just like a festival here today, you know. This is a pretty, um, you know, community-oriented festival. People who come here are generally open-minded, open-hearted people, but not every here, but everyone here is the same ilk politically. And to be able to be in a space where people come together with different experiences and different values, and to be able to share it musically, this idea of coming together and living together, I think is a really, it's a gift that you, that you're that you're, you know, being a part of. So that's awesome. How about a tune? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And then we'll get you guys think of some questions and uh, we'll play it too. Yeah. You want to tell us about it first? Sure. Um, this song sort of came about listening to the radio. Mm-hmm. And protest songs are not popular songs often. Yeah. I mean, sometimes they can mm-hmm. be. But I was just thinking about how it's not, it's kind of a thankless job, but it is like sort of the, the legacy of a folk singer. To write them yeah. in whatever way we see fit, but you know, or whatever way we're called to. So this song was sort of a response to, to thinking about what would happen if we stopped writing them. Okay. Just because they weren't necessarily always received by yeah. everyone. Yeah. And as someone who loves everybody and wants to please them, yeah. it's hard for me to like to displease somebody or make someone feel alienated because yeah. like you said, that's not really the mission either. Yeah. Um, so this song kind of came out of of how important it is to keep using that voice. Um, but also the idea that we all have to show up in the, the way that we know how, mm. and it's going to look really different yeah. for everybody. Right on. So it's called The People Song.
That's a beautiful song. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Michael. really beautiful. Thank you. You guys have any questions? All right. That was quick. <laughs> I was thinking about this. Tell us your name first. My name is Lauren. All right. So your song Shine On, you played that earlier today at your set. Mm -hmm. I know we've all been singing it since we were little. But I wanted to know why, what made you write that song? What were you going through in your life when you wrote it? And was it about someone specific? Was it words of encouragement? Thank you for asking. Um, it was about something specific, and I hesitate to tell it because it has grown into a song that feels like it doesn't belong to me. Never really did, but I, it was inspired uh, by the election results of 2004, and I felt totally duped and discouraged, and I felt like we had been working and momentum was gaining, and um, the re-election of Bush Jr. was just really disheartening, um, which has actually brought more meaning in singing it again yeah, now. Mm. Um, so I was just devastated, and I just felt like, what What are we working for then? Mm -hmm. This is the reality. And we all have moments, I think, like that, when we work hard to, on something we care about, and then we hit a wall, and it's like, should I even keep trying? And um, I went to a local um, pub that I'd never been to after playing that morning for this arts council of people who were celebrating the victory. So it was a really intense show and an intense day, and I was just totally bottom, rock bottom. Mm -hmm. And I talked to my friend who was this like local community organizer, amazing genius visionary guy who'd opened this pub, and it wasn't about he was making this great beer. And this is Joe Short that I'm talking about, but it wasn't about <laughs> it wasn't about his, his beer. He was like, I just want a place for the community to come together and talk about ideas and make things happen starting here and it's gonna grow. And he has grown that, but talking to him that day made me realize, okay, this dude's still excited. Yeah. Like, yeah. and he's so excited. He's still that he in the made game, me, no matter what like, happened. You know, yeah. he put the inspiration in my heart that day and I went home that night and I was like, all right, I gotta just, I gotta keep going and I gotta put something out there that's gonna be useful to help others who might feel the same way, whether yeah. it's about the election or whether it's about something else, completely like unsurmountable seeming, you know. Yeah. So, can you just sing this the chorus of that so people at home? Oh, sure. Know what we're talking about? Yeah. Shine on, shine on. There'll be time enough for darkness when everything's gone. Shine on, shine on There is work to be done in the dark before dawn Beautiful. <laughs> I heard you play that today, and it's a really, really beautiful song. And it's amazing how many people, you know, I was just out there and way in the back outside of the tent, and people had their arms around each other and were singing that song, and... and um, uh, I'm just wondering how, you know, you kind of described being here in this part of Michigan. How has that informed what you do, being a Michigan girl? Um, well, the, the music community here is really rich, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of elders who've been doing it for a long time. So the musical mm -hmm. community, the folk music community especially, mm -hmm. um, definitely has helped me to find a place. Yeah. Um, and and also has taught people how to appreciate music, which has basically been my livelihood, you mm -hmm. know, that appreciation that people have worked really hard to create over the years. Because yeah. you do have to kind of teach people how to appreciate yeah. music, you yeah. know. Um, and so I feel really lucky uh, that I've kind of been brought up in that legacy yeah. of these folk festivals. So, um, And then the collaborations. I'm constantly inspired by my peers. And yeah. And we all support each other. It's not competitive. It's yeah. collaborative. Yeah. So that's really, I feel really grateful for that. But also, there's a lot of, like, polarized views here. Mm -hmm. And even living in northern Michigan, going through this last election, I realized even more how mm -hmm. polarized things were, more than I thought. And, yeah. And so I feel like there's a lot of work to do also. Mm -hmm. And that um, using music to bring people out together into a room looking each other in the eye and mm -hmm. and feeling each other and then talking about some of these things feels really useful mm -hmm. so i think it feels like there's a lot of work and that it's effective work 
Mm -hmm. um, to do. And so I think, um, I don't know if that totally answers your question, but Mm -hmm. those are some things about being here that, I feel like are are unique yeah. or inspiring. Thank you. Uh, you got any other questions? Where, where, where can we find more of your music? <laughs> <laughs> um, you can find more music of mine, but also of the collective that I'm part of, and it's called earthworkmusic.com, and there's so many amazing songwriters and artists um, that are all under that umbrella, and we all focus our music, um, de- definitely community-oriented but also environmental and social social justice and and just really trying to use music as part of the community and as a voice. So mm-hmm. it's kind of our mission nice. together. And we do a lot of work with kids and schools. And, and so, um, yeah, it's a great spot to find a lot of great music if you haven't heard, heard awesome. of it. Awesome, awesome. Well, our podcast is called the Stay Human Podcast. And so I'd like to ask you, in this world that is so, you know, increasingly about uh, you know, identifying people by a number or a, by a blue state or a red state or whatever. How do you hold on to just being human? What are the things that keep you in your humanity? Mm, wow, that's a beautiful question. Mm. I think um, the natural world, mm-hmm. being out in nature and taking those moments and being in that relationship helps to realign me with my natural self mm-hmm. and kind of takes away some of the blankets of whatever judgments and ideas that we have. Yeah. Um, So there's one thing. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think listening Mm. is a really big piece of of how to get back to to what's real. Yeah. And it's something I'm learning about, you know. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much for being on the Stay Human podcast today. It's really an honor to meet you and get to know about your weird family you grew up in. (laughs) My family was 10 times weirder, so there's there's no shame in your game, believe me. And thank you, studio audience, for being here. And uh, people, are you on Instagram and Facebook and all that stuff? You know that? Twitter and all that things? Yeah, I'm not so great at Twitter, but I'm there. Okay. (laughs) But yeah, May Early Wine, you can find me. Can you spell that for me? Yeah, M A Y, and my last name is E R L E W I N E. Right on. Awesome. Well, thank you for being here today on the Stay Human Podcast from Bliss Fest 2017. We love y'all!